Hey everyone, this is The Diplomat, and we are on part 27 of the Chris Watts Discovery read-through. And this begins on page 578, and this is the first portion of the uh, polygraph and interview with Chris Watts. This will be the uh, pre-test interview portion, and the next recording will uh, contain the polygraph questions and the post uh, interview. So I just ask that um, please remember this is an account of what Chris told Tammy and her uh, documentation of it. So please make sure you take everything with a grain of salt um, because A, this is a recollection of Chris and also B, Chris was lying certainly about a lot. So for example, when he says he called the hospitals and hotels uh, or describing going to the Rockies game or quote unquote slipping back into bed to wake Shanann up. Um, those are all examples of things that are most likely not true. And uh, so I just ask that you remember that as you go through this uh, so that as you're listening, you're not thinking that each of these things are necessarily true. So starting on page 578, we have the Colorado Bureau of Investigation report dated August 21st, 2018. And the description is polygraph and interview with Christopher Watts, which occurred on August 15th, 2018 from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. The agent was Tammy Lee from the Denver CBI. And going on uh, to the next page, we have the victims listed, Bella Watts. Celeste Watts and Shanann Watts with the subject listed Chris Watts. Synopsis. Frederick Police Department Detective Dave Baumover requested I, CBI agent Tammy Lee, conduct a polygraph on Christopher Lee Watts, age 33, born on uh, May 16, 1985. The polygraph was in reference to Watts' possible involvement or knowledge in the disappearance of his pregnant wife. Shanann Watts, age 34, and their two young daughters, Bella and Celeste, ages 4 and 3. The polygraph was conducted on Wednesday, August 15, 2018, at which time Watts showed deception indicated, DI, on his polygraph. Action taken. On Wednesday, August 15, 2018, Chris Watts voluntarily consented to a recorded polygraph interview. The interview took place at the Frederick Police Department, which was located at 333 Fifth Street in Frederick, Colorado. It was my understanding the primary purpose of the interview was to determine if Watts had any knowledge or involvement in the disappearance of his wife and two young daughters. The day before the polygraph interview, I assisted the FPD with the initial investigation into the disappearance of Shanann, Bella, and Celeste Watts. I also observed a voluntary interview with Chris, which was conducted the prior evening by FBI Special Agent Graham Coder. During the interview with S.A. Coder, Watts denied having any knowledge regarding the whereabouts of his wife and children. Watts was also adamant there was no infidelity in his marriage of any kind. S.A. Coder asked Chris if he would be willing to take a polygraph, and Chris agreed. Chris stated he had to pick up his father, later identified as Ronnie Watts, age 62, from the airport early the next morning. So the polygraph was scheduled for Wednesday, August 15th at 11 a.m. Chris then left the Frederick Police Department for the evening. It should be noted that approximately three hours before the polygraph was scheduled to begin, 8 a.m., I received a phone call from Anadarko Regional Security Manager Tony. Tony advised he had reviewed Chris's computer network traffic and it was possible Chris had started a relationship with an Anadarko contra contracted employee. Tony advised he located emails between Chris and the contracted employee, who he identified as the mistress, age 30. Tony said it appeared a relationship between Chris and his mistress started around June of 2018. Tony further explained his, the mistress was on the geosciences side of the company and helped survey land. Tony explained Chris and his mistress worked out of the same office in Platteville, Colorado. Tony advised he would be forwarding the emails to law enforcement as soon as it was cleared by their legal department. The emails received by Tony are attached to this report. Pre-test interview. 
On Wednesday, August 15th at approximately 11 a.m., S.A. Coder met Chris in the lobby of the FPD and escorted him to a private interview room inside the police department. Chris was wearing a short-sleeve North Carolina Tar Heels t-shirt, black athletic shorts, and black flip-flops, in parentheses, no wedding ring. I greeted Chris inside the interview room and the door was shut. I told Chris the door automatically locks from the inside, but there was a key inserted into the lock that could be turned to open the door. I also explained to Chris the door was shut for privacy, but he was not under arrest and could leave at any time. Chris said he understood. In parentheses, it should be noted I was not wearing a gun, badge, handcuffs, magazines, or any other police insignia during the polygraph and interview. Next, CBI's polygraph procedures were explained to Chris. I read Chris his Miranda rights and explained to him that he did not have to talk to me. Chris signed the advisement of rights from stating he understood his rights and wished to continue with the interview and polygraph. Chris also signed a consent form indicating his willingness to undergo a polygraph examination. During the pretest interview, Chris told me the following, in parentheses, Note, below is only a summary of our conversation. Please review the attached transcript, audio file, and video recordings in their entireties for full details on the interview. With regard to Chris's background and upbringing, Growing up, he lived with his mother, father, and sister, Jamie. His father worked as a parts manager for a Ford dealership. His mother worked as a secretary and notary for a used car dealership. Jamie is seven years older than him. He gets along well with Jamie and her husband. He, saw, he just saw Jamie and her family during his recent visit to North Carolina. He was in North Carolina August 1st to August 7th, 2018. Growing up, Chris's family attended First Baptist Church on a fairly regular basis. He was always the quote-unquote quiet kid who followed the rules. Jamie was the rebellious child in the family. Jamie left numerous times after high school and would always move back home. His father was the disciplinarian in the family. His father would not use physical discipline, but would raise his voice. His father struggled with substance abuse after Chris moved out. It was hard on his father when Chris left because his father was used to him always being around. His father is his hero and his best friend. After he graduated high school, he moved to Morrisville, North Carolina. He attended NASCAR College in Morrisville, North Carolina. NASCAR College was a mechanical school. He understands numbers and math very well. From 2001 to 2012, he worked for Morrisville Ford. From 2012 to 2014, he worked at Longmont Ford in Colorado. While he worked for Ford, he developed the onset of carpal tunnel in both of his hands. Since leaving Ford, he no longer has pains in his hands. In 2014, he worked for Covenant Testing Technologies, oil field contractor. In January of 2015, he was hired to work to Anadarko. He currently works as a field coordinator with Anadarko. He usually helps his guys in the field and tries to get everyone off of work by 3 to 3.30 p.m. He usually starts his work day at 6 to 6.30 every day. Some people at work call him, in quotes, Rain Man, because if he goes to an oil site once, he will remember it. He stayed the prior evening, Tuesday, August 14th, 2018, at Nick and Amanda's house. He met Amanda while she was a director at Primrose School, where Bella and Cece attended. Amanda currently works as a downline from Shanann in the company Thrive. Thrive sells vitamins and minerals that are all plant-based. Thrive is a three-step system, which includes capsules in the morning, a protein shake with water, and a patch you wear on your skin. Thrive is extremely healthy. Chris weighed 245 pounds before he started using Thrive in 2016. Chris is a downline from Shanann, but she sells for him. Shanann knows he is not a seller and told him he would tell people too much about the product. One person at his work, Troy, buys Thrive from him. He and Troy are both su field supervisors for Anna Darko. He and Troy have hung out a few times out of work with their families. With regard to his relationship with Shanann, he met Shanann in 2010 through Facebook. His cousin's wife recommended he and Shanann become friends on Facebook. He started talking to Shanann and they had their first date at a movie theater. Shanann was not impressed with him because he came to the date very underdressed. He and Shanann's second date was at a rock concert. He and Shanann spent their third date at Myrtle Beach. Shanann suffered from lupus and it was quote-unquote acting up 
on their date at Myrtle Beach. On the drive back from Myrtle Beach, she laid on his lap the entire time. Shanann realized he was a really nice guy because he let her lay on his lap for two and a half hours. He proposed to Shanann in 2011 at Ocean Isle Beach. Shanann is very OCD about organization and planned the entire wedding. In November of 2012, he and Shanann wed at the Doubletree Hilton in North Carolina. Their wedding was amazing. They spent their honeymoon in Myrtle Beach. In December of 2013, their daughter Bella was born. Bella was a gift because doctors warned them Shanann may not be able to have children due to her lupus. In July of 2015, Cece was born. Bella was a mama's girl and Cece was a daddy's girl. Cece was rambunctious and was always moving until she fell asleep. Cece loved riding in the airplane on the way back from North Carolina. He was excited when he found out Shanann was pregnant with their third child. Shanann had an ultrasound the prior week, August 8th, and they found out they were having a boy. Shanann used fertility drugs with both Bella and Cece. Shanann was not using any fertility drugs when she got pregnant with their third child. They only tried twice when Shanann got pregnant with their son. Shanann believed she got pregnant because she was using Thrive and had a much healthier lifestyle. Shanann did not suffer from postpartum with any of her pregnancies. Shanann found out she was pregnant with their son the first or second week of June. Shanann is currently 14 to 15 weeks pregnant. With regard to the family's recent trip to North Carolina, he and Shanann went on a Thrive trip to San Diego the end of June 2018. He and Shanann returned from San Diego on June 26, 2018. Shanann's father watched their girls while they were in San Diego. Later the same day, June 26, Shanann, Bella, Cece, and Shanann's father flew to North Carolina. While in North Carolina, Shanann and the girls visited both sides of the family. Shanann needed to meet up with some of her promoters and customers while she was in North Carolina. Shanann wanted both sets of grandparents to watch Bella and Cece while she was working. Cece's birthday occurred during their trip to North Carolina, so they had a birthday party for her. Shanann FaceTimed him during the party so he could watch it. While Shanann and the girls stayed in North Carolina, he stayed home, worked, worked out, ran, and kept the house together. He flew out to North Carolina on July 31st so he could fly back to Colorado with Shanann and the girls. He spent a week in North Carolina with his family. The night he arrived in North Carolina, he stayed at Shanann's parents' house. The following day, he, Shanann, and the girls drove to the beach, North Myrtle Beach, and stayed there for four to five days. It was the first time his daughters had ever seen the beach. Cece loved the beach and her bathing suit was full of seashells. He was able to visit his paternal grandmother in the nursing home. His grandmother lights up when she sees her da his daughters. His dad came and picked him up and he spent a day with the parents. He hung out with his parents and visited with his sister and her family. On August 7th, he and Shanann packed up and flew back home to Colorado. August 8th, he returned to work. August 10th, Shanann flew out to Arizona with her friend, Nicole. He spent Friday, August 10th, Saturday, August 11th, and Sunday, August 12th with his girls. On Sunday, August 12th, he took his girls to a birthday party for Jeremy's son who turned four years old. There was a mini pool at the birthday party and his girls, quote unquote, had an epic time. They drove back home after the party and he gave his girls a shower and put them to bed. He waited to hear from Shanann, who was going to fly back to Colorado that evening. Shanann's airplane got delayed because they couldn't find a flight crew. Shanann was supposed to arrive in Denver at 11 p.m., but she didn't end up getting in until approximately 2 a.m. With regard to the events that occurred after Shanann arrived home from Arizona. Shanann returned home around 2 a.m. and got into bed. His doorbell alert showed Shanann walking inside at 1.48 a.m. His alarm went off at 4 a.m. so he could get up and go to work. He got up, brushed his teeth, and put on deodorant. He did not take a shower because he works in the oil field and showers when he gets home from work. Shanann told him before she got home that she wanted him to wake her up when he got up so she could shower and quote-unquote get the airport off me. He woke Shanann up after he got ready and they talked about selling the house and separating. He and Shanann's conversation was emotional. He and Shanann were both crying. After he and Shanann talked, Shanann said she was going to take the kids to a friend's house and she would return later the same day. He told Shanann that was fine and went downstairs to pack his lunch, fill up his water jug, and collect his computer.
He loaded his truck and went to work. After he got to work, he texted Shanann at 7.40 a.m. because he hadn't heard from her and he didn't know where she was going. He texted Shanann and asked her to tell him where she took the kids. Shanann did not reply to his text. It is normal for Shanann to not respond to his texts because her priority is to respond to her direct salespeople. He continued working and at noon he realized he never heard from Shanann. He called and texted Shanann and said in quotes, Hey, call me. At 12.10 p.m. he received a doorbell alarm on his cell phone stating someone was at the front door. Nicole was at his front door, so he called her. He asked Nicole what was going on, and Nicole said she hadn't heard from Shanann the entire day. He thought, in quotes, all right, this is kind of strange. Nicole told him Shanann's car was there, and she could see Shanann's shoes by the front door. He left work and headed home. Nicole told him there would be a police officer there when he got home. Nicole wasn't able to get inside because there was a top latch on the inside of the front door. They use the top latch on the front door to make sure the kids cannot get outside without them knowing. The keypad on the outside of the garage door did not work. The police and Nicole had to wait until he arrived so he could use his garage door opener. When he arrived home, they went inside the house. And then this is a quote from Chris. Cars there, car seats are there, purse is still there, the phone's on the couch, like her wedding rings sitting on the nightstand. There's like no sign of Bella, Celeste, her anywhere. Bella and Cece's beds were not made. The sheets were off of his and Shanann's bed. It is common for Shanann to wash the bed sheets when she slept in the bed after coming home directly from the airport. He believes Shanann woke up and decided to strip the bed to wash the sheets. He quote-unquote washed everything, all the sheets Shanann had stripped and left on the floor in the bedroom, and put different sheets from the closet onto the bed. In parentheses, Chris described this had occurred after the police searched his home Monday. The sheets Shanann had taken off the bed should be clean in a pile in the bedroom where he left them. They found Shanann's cell phone and powered it up. There were numerous text messages that started coming through from people trying to get a hold of Shanann. Another quote from Chris. Everything that was there just didn't make sense. As far as, like, why, like, what happened... He started reaching out to numerous friends who had car seats or had kids in general. No one had heard from Shanann. Detective Baumover arrived at his residence and interviewed him, Nicole, and Nicole's son, Nick. The police talked to Chris's neighbor because he had a camera with a few different angles. Chris watched the surveillance video and didn't see Shanann leaving at all. There was no video of Shanann leaving out the front of the house. He knew Shanann wouldn't just leave everything at home, which included the girl's medicine. In parentheses, Chris later mentioned that Shanann takes Imitrex for migraines, and it was also missing from the residence. The only thing missing from the house were the girls' blankies. The girls usually take their blankies wherever, whenever they leave the house. Cece had a New York Yankees blanket, a little dinosaur, a turtle, and an animated dog. Bella had two blankies, but one was left at the house. Bella had a dinosaur and a swan blanket that were missing. Bella's animated cat was left at the house. The police went around his neighborhood to ask if anyone else had surveillance video or if they saw something. Quote unquote, we had nothing at all. He hoped Shanann and the girls were just at a friend's house decompressing and they were safe. That evening of Monday, August 13th, he called hospitals and hotels. He kept every light in the house on just in case they came home. He laid in bed, but he didn't sleep. He had friends who came over to show their support. Everyone told him they hoped that Shanann was okay. He hoped he would get a knock on the door, a call, or a text. He hoped Shanann would buy a burner phone so she could at least call him and tell him she's okay. He misses the kids sitting at the dinner table and having to tell them to eat. He misses the kids throwing their chicken nuggets at him. He went to the kids' rooms to make their beds and realized he didn't need to turn on the rain machine. Wouldn't be able to read them a book. Wasn't going to kiss them goodnight wasn't giving them their nighttime snack, wasn't giving them their medicine, wasn't getting them dressed for bed, and didn't need to turn on the monitor to watch them. He didn't want to stay in the house Monday night, but he knew he needed to be there in case they came home. Shanann and the girls did not come home Monday night. On Tuesday, August 14th, the police called him and told him they were going to issue a missing persons report. The news crews came over and the police used drones and canine units, in quotes, it all set in, like, this is not, she's, she's not, 
they like something happened because all this right here this means that okay my worst fear that's where this is going he hopes wherever shenan and the girls are they are safe in quotes i really i really hope they can just come home being at home and not being able to tuck his girls in and then in quotes it's heart-wrenching it's earth-shattering right now because that's those are my kids those are like like you made those kids you know his kids were gone for five weeks and he got to facetime them every night in quotes they were just here and not knowing where they are now it's a nightmare right now with regard to if he still believed shanann was at a friend's house in quotes at this point i don't because all this like everything that's happened now end quote it made him feel like shenan vanished and hopefully had the kids at a hotel he just wants shenan to be safe with the fbi and cbi involved in the investigation it made him feel like somebody maybe had shenan who is not keeping her safe or in quotes or something terrible has happened and that is that's a nightmare end quote he thought that someone could have hurt his wife and girls in quotes it's running through my mind that somebody has hurt them and they are not safe and i really want them to be safe i want them to come home end quote with regard to shenan's trip to arizona shenan was attending a thrive local conference shenan made between 65 and 70 thousand a year with thrive shenan had approximately 200 people who are signed up under her with regard to when he first realized he wanted to separate from Shanann, he decided he wanted to separate from Shanann during the five weeks Shanann and the girls were in North Carolina. Shanann left for North Carolina on Ju June 26th. While she was gone, he and Shanann could feel the disconnect through their calls and texts. He and Shanann spoke less and less and were, in quotes, less lovey-dovey. As of a year ago, he could tell his relationship with Shanann wasn't as, in quotes, hot and heavy as when they first met. He hoped the issues in his relationship with Shanann would just work themselves out. He and Shanann stopped going out on dates after they started having children. And in quotes, I'm not going to blame the kids for disconnection or anything, but like, yeah, we focus like on the kids like all the time. End quote. He and Shanann stopped having deep conversations. When he flew out to North Carolina, he met Shanann and the girls at the airport. He hugged his girls and gave Shanann a hug and a kiss. In quotes. You can just feel it start from there, like everything just felt like different, end quote. Every night he was in North Carolina, he and Shanann talked, but it was mostly through texts. Shanann's family was there, and they really couldn't get their feelings across, except through texts. Chris arrived in North Carolina on July 31st, and they went to the beach on August 1st. Shanann's father was with them for a few days, so he and Shanann were rarely alone together. He and Shanann discussed over text where their relationship was going. North Carolina was the first time he and Shanann ever discussed separating, in quotes. Like, if we're bringing a third kid into this world, like, like what's, what's our relationship going to look like? Is it going to be, are we going to be, are we going to work this out? Or is this going to lead to a separation? Or is it going to lead somewhere like we stay together and be civil with the kids? Or are we going to be our separate ways? End quote. Shanann was very emotional and there was a lot of crying. He told Shanann he didn't feel the same connection with her anymore. He didn't feel like he could be himself anymore or the person Shanann needed him to be. Both he and Shanann wanted to see if they could make their relationship work. Shanann suggested they read a book and go to counseling. When Shanann went to Arizona, she confide, confided in many friends about their relationship. After Shanann disappeared, he spoke to many of Shanann's friends who told him they knew he and Shanann were having issues. He wasn't aware if Shanann told anyone about the possible separation. Shanann's friends said they could tell her emotional state was different. He did not sleep in the same bed with Shanann while they were in North Carolina. He slept with the girls one night and slept on the couch. He and Shanann did not have sex in North Carolina. He and Shanann were not affectionate with each other during the trip. Shanann accused him of cheating, and he told her, in quotes, You know that would never happen. Like, you know the kind of guy I am, end quote. He was at his friend's Jeremy's house, and Jeremy told him he was the type of guy who could go away with his wife for a week, and he knew nothing would happen, in quotes. People know the kind of person I am. Like, I'm not the type of guy that's just going to say, All right, my wife's gone. Like, 
who's the who's the girl like I can find for this like five weeks like no that's not me like I respect my wife and she respects me like if she's somewhere safe right now like I don't think it would be with a guy I never had an inkling she would do the same do anything to me you know end quotes sometimes when Shanann called him while she was gone he was out for a run or working out and didn't answer the phone Shanann and the girls had never been away from him for that long in the past. Shanann was more emotional when she was pregnant. Shanann was under a lot of stress being around both of their families. Shanann most likely confided in her friends Nicole and Cassie about her relationship with Chris. Shanann did not confide in her mother about their relationship. With regard to his physical relationship with Shanann, the last time he and Shanann had sex was in May 2018 when they conceived their third child. He and Shanann talked about having a third child. Shanann kept track of her ovulation cycle. Before May 2018, he and Shanann had sex once or twice a week. There were times that would go a month or two without having sex. He was usually the one who would initiate sex. Most times, he was shot down by Shanann for sex. He enjoyed having sex with Shanann. Shanann was more emotional when she was pregnant. With regard to his and Shanann's relationship with their in-laws, there was an incident while Shanann and the girls were in North Carolina. Chris's mother had ice cream in her house that Cece was allergic to. Cece was allergic to tree nuts and kiwi. Cece was the type of kid who would lunge to get the ice cream and her reaction to tree nuts was getting worse each time she saw the allergist. One of his sister's kids ate the ice cream next to Cece and Shanann said the kids could no longer visit his parents. When he arrived in North Carolina, his parents told him they hadn't seen the kids for two weeks. He was hurt because he wanted his parents to see their grandbabies. He went to visit his parents and sister without Shanann and the girls. With regard to if he and Shanann talked about counseling, he and Shanann discussed going to counseling on August 8, 2018. He told Shanann he didn't think they needed to go to counseling. He felt like anything they needed to say to each other they could just say. Shanann told him she had married friends who were still going to counseling. He was open to the idea of counseling, but he didn't want to do it. He already felt disconnected from Shanann and didn't feel like counseling was going to help. With regard to his schedule on August 8th through 12th, he worked on Wednesday and Thursday, August 8th and 9th. On Friday, August 10th, he took off work because Shanann flew out to Arizona. Nicole picked up Shanann uh, to go to the airport early in the morning. He hugged Shanann goodbye. He told Shanann to let him know when she arrived and told her he would send her pictures of the girls. When Shanann left for Arizona, he and Shanann talked about counseling and knew the sex of their ch third child. They weren't going to tell their family what the sex of the baby was until Shanann got home. Nicole knew the sex of the baby and was planning a gender reveal party. He waited for the girls to wake up and then they hung out around the house. He took the girls to the grocery store and to fix his eyeglasses which had some cracks in the frame. They went to Target and also picked up their click list groceries from King Supers. His children attend Primrose School in Erie five days a week, but the school was closed on Friday, August 10th, for a teacher work day. He and the girls got home around 4.30 p.m. Friday evening, he made the girls dinner and got them ready for bed. He does not call or FaceTime Shanann with the girls while she is gone because the girls would get very upset. Bella asked repeatedly about Shanann while she was in Arizona. Bella and Cece would have a quote-unquote cry fest if they talked to Shanann while she was gone. Bella and Cece went to bed between 7.30 and 8. After the girls went to bed, he went downstairs and worked out. He watched Sports Center. He did not have anyone come over on Friday. On Saturday, August 11th, Bella got into bed with him that morning and they waited for Cece to wake up. He was going to go to Costco that day, but Shanann told him she would do it when she returned. He hung out at the house with Bella and Cece and played outside before it got too hot. He and the girls played inside their playroom. At 5 p.m., Jeremy's daughter McKenna came over to babysit while he went to a Colorado Rockies game. The game started at 6.10 p.m. He went to the Rockies game with some people from work, Cody and Sam. He, Cody, and Sam ate at the Lazy Dog before the game. He did not talk to Cody or Sam about his relationship with Shanann. His supervisor, Luke, was the only one at work that knew he and his wife may get separated. He told Luke to say something if he saw his mind wasn't on task. The Rockies game was part of a raffle they did at work. Their seats were on the third baseline approximately 10 rows up. 
The Rockies won after a walk-off three-run home run in the bottom of the ninth inning. He talked to Shanann on the way home from the game to ask her how much he should pay McKenna. He stopped at the ATM inside the Conoco gas station next to his house so he had money to pay McKenna. He got home at approximately 11 p.m. The girls were already sleeping in their own beds. The girls have their own bedrooms and share a Jack and Jill bathroom. On Sunday, August 12th, Bella woke up and went into Cece's room and woke her up. He and the girls went downstairs and watched Bubble Guppies. He put the girls down early for a nap because Jeremy's son was having his fourth birthday party. He woke the girls up from their nap around 12.30 p.m. and went to Jeremy's house. In parentheses, Chris recalled he and the girls went to Target earlier in the day to purchase a birthday present. Chris said they came home from Target and he fed them leftover cold pizza. They stayed at Jeremy's house from 1.15 till 4.30 to 5 p.m. He didn't know the party was going to have water balloons and a pool. He hadn't packed swimsuits or water shoes for the girls. Cece and Bella had a lot of fun playing in the water. He sent Shanann pictures of the, and videos of the girls from the party. When they got home, he gave Bella and Cece a shower because they had sand on them. He got the girls out of the shower, dried them off, put lotion on them, and got their pajamas on. Cece had on a pink nightgown with a drawing of a bird on it and a nighttime diaper. Bella had on a multicolored gown that said, Believe, in quotes, or had a unicorn on it. The girls get hot at night, but they don't take off their pajamas. Chris explained sometimes the girls will remove pajama pants if they get hot at night. They went downstairs and the girls wanted more cold pizza for dinner. He FaceTimed Shanann's parents with the girls. Bella and Cece sat on their little couches and he got them snacks. He gave Cece vanilla wafers and Bella had some chips. The girls ended up swapping their snacks. He brushed the girls' teeth, had them use the potty and put them to bed. The girls will lay in bed, but they don't normally get out of bed after their rain machines are on and the lights are out. In quotes. Bella came out twice that time, just cause she knew, like, Shanann was coming home. End quotes. Bella came out of her room and asked if Shanann was home yet. He told Bella Shanann would be there when she woke up. Cece never came out of her room after he put her to bed. Sunday evening, Shanann texted him and told him about the power being out in Arizona from the dust storms. Shanann told him her friends Addie and Cindy paid for her dinner. Shanann's flight ended up getting delayed. He could tell Shanann was ready to get home to see her girls. In quotes, she was just ready to be home, be with us, and just kind of like be around us, end quote. Shanann was supposed to be home at 11 p.m. before her flight got delayed. Shanann didn't end up getting home until 2 a.m. He felt Shanann get into bed. The doorbell motion sensor picked Shanann up as she walked up to the front door, which he explained he saw on his phone later that Monday. The doorbell alert is tied to his entire home security system. They have alerts on their front door, rear sliding door, garage doors, basement door, and motion sensors in their living room and basement, garden level. It will alert if a door is left open for a certain period of time. They only use the living room and basement motion sensors when they leave and set it to away. He couldn't check the surveillance system for any clues surrounding Shanann and the girl's disappearance because there had been so many alerts and the his history didn't go back that far. He is not sure how many events his surveillance system can store. The only thing he saw that was strange was that when he left for work, the surveillance system said the garage door was left open 5.27 a.m. A minute before receiving the notification that the garage door was left open, there was another notification stating the basement door, door on main floor leading down to basement, was left open 5.27 a.m. He did not recall seeing the basement door open when he looked around the house for Shanann and the girls. He usually works out in the basement, but he didn't work out the mo morning of Monday, August 13th. The surveillance system is called Vivint, and it is an app on their cell phones. The surveillance system uses Shanann's email and password. The surveillance system was installed a few years ago. With regard to what happened when Shanann got into bed Monday morning, August 13th, he felt Shanann get into bed. He sleeps facing the wall on the right side and Shanann sleeps on the left side of the bed. He did not believe Shanann unpacked her suitcase because it was still at home. He did not believe Shanann was using her cell phone after she got into bed. With regard to Shanann's normal nightly routine, Shanann would brush her teeth, use makeup remover, take balance, and lay in bed and text or call people. 
Shanann would charge her cell phone next to the bed. Shanann had an Apple Watch and would take it off and charge it each night. Shanann sleeps in a t-shirt and underwear. That morning, Monday, Shanann was wearing a t-shirt and underwear. Shanann always wore her wedding ring to bed. Shanann would only take off her wedding ring to color her hair. Shanann never stopped wearing her wedding ring even though they discussed separating. Shanann wore her wedding ring to Arizona. It was very unusual that Shanann's wedding ring was left on the nightstand. Shanann colored her hair the week before in North Carolina so she did not color it at home. He got up at 4 a.m. and got ready for work. He went downstairs and made a protein shake, packed his lunch, filled up his water jug, collected his book bag, got his computer, and put more tools in his truck. Chris described his work truck as being parked on the corner of the house, west side. Shanann told him the night before to wake her up when he went to work so she could shower. He woke Shanann up because he didn't want to assume she wanted to sleep and he knew he needed to do what she said because he didn't want to make her mad. He slipped, in quotes, back into bed and rubbed Shanann's shoulder and head to wake her up slowly. He was on top of the covers and was fully dressed in his work clothes. He asked Shanann if she wanted to wake up and take a shower. Shanann said yes and he asked her if they could talk a little bit. Shanann agreed, so he told Shanann they needed to sell the house and downsize. Their mortgage was $2,700 per month. They lived in their home since May of 2013. Shanann had already contacted the realtor the week before. He suggested they get a less expensive house in Brighton or North Glen. He told Shanann he didn't feel a connection with her any longer. He told Shanann their relationship wasn't working and the love they had for each other in the beginning was gone. Shanann cried and it was very emotional. Shanann was upset and she asked him if there was someone else. He told Shanann there was no one else and it was just him talking to her about their relationship. In quotes, This isn't like somebody came into my life and took me from you. There's no outside influence coming from this. End quote. Shanann believed him that he didn't have anyone else in his life. Shanann wouldn't have an affair on him and she knows he would never cheat on her. The only time Shanann was suspicious of him was early in their relationship when they first started dating and he was still getting messages from other women. Shanann had full access to his cell phone and often used it to make posts on Facebook about Thrive. He never logged into Shanann's Facebook and only did recently because the police and news crews wanted to see pictures. He and Shanann talked from about 4.15 a.m. until 5 a.m. He hoped he and Shanann could sell their house and each leave with some money. He hoped Shanann would stay in Colorado because Shanann told him in the past that if they separated, she couldn't afford to live in Colorado on her own. He hoped they could split the money from their home and still live close to each other. During their talk, he and Shanann never got physical with each other. He and Shanann have never raised a hand to one another or struck each other for any reason. He and Shanann rarely even yell at each other. When he and Shanann talk, in quotes, it's pretty civil. After he talked to Shanann, he backed his work truck, F-250, up to his garage door so he could load his large clear containers, O-rings, earbuds, and some combination wrenches from his personal toolbox. Chris explained he normally takes his tools out of his work truck every Friday and backs up to his garage door and loads his tools when he returns to work after the weekend. His work truck was backed up about an eighth of the way into the garage because Shanann's car was parked inside. His work truck won't fit in the garage because it's too long. It took him approximately 10 minutes to load his work truck. He loaded his truck from 5.15 a.m. to approximately 5.25 a.m. He got into the truck, hit the button for the garage door to close, and drove to work. With regard to his route to work Monday morning, he took Saratoga Trail right on Wyndham Hill Parkway, right at roundabout at County Road 7, left on County Road 52, took County Road 52 east to I-76, took I-76 to Rogan, and then drove out to Survey Ranch, possibly on County Road 386. He knows where everything is located in his area. When he arrived at work, he went to Survey 319, Survey 1129, Survey 1029, and Survey 629. Chris later estimated Anadarko's oil well sites cover approximately 10 to 20 square miles. Chris explained there is also a large number of cattle, sheep, and irrigation spots on the property. When he arrived at work at approximately 6.45 a.m., he first went to Survey 319 oil well site. No one was there when he arrived, but Troy, Melissa, and Chad showed up. Cody was working, but he was working at Survey 1029. 
Troy, Melissa, and Chad arrived at Survey 319 around 7.15 to 7.30. He was trying to pressure test the line to see if he could find a leak. Troy, Melissa, and Chad weren't at Survey 319 when he arrived because most days the workers either go to the office or the field first. He knew Cody had a leak at Survey 319 over the weekend, so he, Chris, wanted to check it out and make sure they didn't have a health, safety, or environmental issue on their hands. I asked Chris if it was normal for him to leave his house around 5.30 a.m. and arrive at the oil well site at 6.45 a.m. In quotes, I'll usually leave between 5.30 and 6 o'clock, somewhere around there. I just knew it'd take us a little while to get out there. I wanted to be out like we usually like to start work at like 6.30, end quotes. He did not stop anywhere along his trip to work on Monday morning. He did not see anyone he knew on the way to work. He called Troy, Melissa, and Chad while he was out at the oil field, but the calls wouldn't go through. He worked at Survey 319 from 6.45 a.m. until approximately 8 a.m. He worked at Survey 629 until approximately 8.30 a.m. Chris explained no other workers were at Survey 629 when he was there. He drove over to Survey 1129 at 9 a.m. to see if it was ready to run, and it wasn't. He left Survey 1129 at 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. he drove to Survey 1029 and stayed there until he left to come home at 1 p.m. With regard to the pol policies pertaining to having civilians in his work truck, Bella and Cece have played in his truck a few times. Shanann has been in his truck to see what he had in there, but she had never ridden in his truck. They are only allowed to take other Anadarko employees and trainees in their work trucks. With regard to if he made any phone calls while he was at work, he texted Cody, Troy and Chad and ended up calling and talking to Luke to let him know he was out at Survey Ranch. He texted Shanann and also tried to call Shanann, but she didn't answer and his call went to voicemail. He called Nicole after he received the front do door bell alert. Nicole told him Shanann hadn't answered anyone. She could see the shoes Shanann wore home from the airport sitting inside the front door and Shanann's car was in the garage. He wouldn't know if Shanann had other pairs of shoes missing because she had an entire shoe closet. He called Luke on his way home from work to let him know they couldn't find Shanann or the kids. With regards to if he called Primrose School, in quotes, Yeah, I don't remember what time that was, but I asked if the kids were there, end quote. I asked Chris if he had any other conversation with Primrose that morning. He, he told Primrose that they were more than likely going to put the house up for sale and he wasn't sure if they would be staying in the area. He told Primrose he wanted the kids to stay on the waiting list. Primrose charges on Mondays for the week and Monday was going to be the girl's first day back. With regard to the route he took to get home. He drove I-76 west to County Road 52 west and took it home. With regard to Chris's financial situation. Last year he and Shanann spent approximately 25000 over 500 each week for their daughters to attend Primrose School. Shanann had surgery on a compressed disc in her neck last year. He and Shanann had insurance, but the surgery was over $100,000. He pays over a $500 a month for health insurance through Anna Darko. Shanann handled all of the finances, so he did not know how much they had left to pay on her medical bills. Cece had acid reflux, and they had medical bills related to her endoscopies. They had numerous medical bills related to Cece's allergy testing, Cece's blocked tear duct, and both girls had tubes in their ears and their adenoids removed. Both of his girls had inhalers for child asthma. Cece took Singulair for her allergies, and Bella and Cece took medication for acid reflux. They owe approximately eight to ten thousand dollars in credit card debt. Their Lexus was paid for by Lavelle through a car allowance. He and Shanann filed for bankruptcy two years prior. He does not recall how much was discharged during the bankruptcy. He knew when the kids returned to school that they would be living paycheck to paycheck. Shanann recently took out $10,000 from his 401k to pa catch up on their mortgage payments. Chris believed the loan against his 401k was taken out approximately five months ago. They were three months behind on their mortgage payments. They had received a letter from Chase Bank pertaining to their delinquent home loan. He and Shanann were stressed about their financial situation. He currently owes his mortgage payment for August, which is due tomorrow, August 16th. He currently has $2,000 in his Chase checking account and approximately $1,500 in their USAA checking account. Almost all of their credit cards are maxed out. Shanann had only been paying the minimum payment on their credit cards. With regards to life insurance, 
He has a policy on Shanann and the girls through Anna Darko. Bella and Cece had a $20,000 each policy, and Shanann had a $50,000 or $100,000 policy. He has his own policy, and he believed Shanann may have gotten another life insurance policy on her own. Shanann got their policies through his cousin's wife, Nicole, so he does not know how much they were. Shanann and Nicole had a falling out over a money thing. He believed Nicole and Shanann's old boss believed Shanann had embezzled money from the business. Shanann's old boss owned a bunch of wheel shops. He believed the accusation against Shanann occurred around 2010, which was right before he uh, met Shanann. Shanann and her old boss are still good friends, and her old boss has been contacting people around the world about her disappearance. He has not talked to Nicole for years. With regard to what he believed happened to Shanann, Bella, and Cece, in quotes, like the first day I thought she was with somebody, end quote. He thought Shanann was decompressing at a friend's house. He now believes Shanann is not safe, is possibly in trouble, or somebody has hurt her and the kids. So that's where we're going to end this part, and uh, next we will get into the actual polygraph questions and the post-polygraph interview. So, um, more to come on this, and uh, I thank you as always for listening. Thank you for being here and showing your support. In loving memory of Shanann, Bella, Celeste, and Nico, God, we ask, please bless the Rusek family. This is The Diplomat. Have a great day.